Coming up on today's episode of The Virtual Couch, we'll learn what the language of depression is and will it eventually cost me my job? That and more coming up on this episode of The Virtual Couch. Hey, before we get to the podcast today, one of my favorite things, reading listener email. Here we go. Dear Tony, exclamation point. First off, I'm a big fan of the podcast. You put the fun in mental health. All right, I'll get right to the point and I'll be honest. How about that? I'm one of those who has emailed you in the past to see if you're accepting new clients. I've never been to therapy and I've honestly felt a connection with you through my earbuds and you've truly given me so many useful tools. But as my emotional baseline continues to rise, I now realize a lot of things that I felt I couldn't get over in my life that I now can. Now I'm to a place where I want to do the work on myself, so I need a therapist. I never thought I would say that. I figured you were busy, but right about the time you emailed me back to let me know that you couldn't fit me in, but P.S., you did it in a very nice way, you also started advertising BetterHelp.com. So maybe I'm being a bit corny, but I sort of viewed that as a sign. So I signed up through your link, don't worry, BetterHelp.com slash virtual couch, so I could get 10% off my first month of service, and within 48 hours, I was meeting with a therapist online. I love my therapist. She's amazing. She knows acceptance and commitment therapy, and P.S., now I have her listening to the virtual couch. So thank you for the podcast and thank you for advertising BetterHelp.com. I can't imagine where I would be if I hadn't started listening to the podcast and if I hadn't started using BetterHelp.com, of course, slash virtual couch. Oh, and I heard you say on the episode with your daughter and then I think on the one with your neighbors, Nicole and Aisley, that you'd love to get your wife on the podcast. I would love that too. Just putting that out there. All right. Thank you for the email. And yes, I would love to have her come on too. Right now, I believe she said that she would consider it somewhere around our 50th anniversary. And so to put that into perspective, when this podcast comes out, we're going to be within a day or two of celebrating our 29th anniversary. So i uh, got a little bit more time to get to, to get her on. But I would highly encourage you to do what this listener has done. Go check out what over 500,000 people have already done before you. Sign up right now by going to betterhelp.com slash virtual couch and, and get the help that you need or that you didn't even know that you needed. What are you waiting for? They have a broad range of expertise in their counselor network, which might not be locally available in many areas. The service is available for clients worldwide. You can log on to your account anytime and send a message to your counselor and you'll get timely and thoughtful responses and you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you don't ever have to wait in an uncomfortable waiting room as you do with traditional therapy. At that point, I do want to add that I think that my waiting room is, is very comfy. BetterHelp.com will assess your needs, match you with your own licensed professional therapist, and they're committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. It's more affordable than traditional online count- offline counseling, and I love this part, financial aid is available. So BetterHelp.com wants you to start living a better life today. Go to BetterHelp.com slash virtual couch, and you'll get 10% off your first month's treatment. Again, that's BetterHelp.com slash virtual couch. All right, let's get on to the show. episode 159 of The Virtual Couch. I'm your host, Tony Overbay. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, certified mindful habit coach, writer, speaker, husband, father of four, ultra marathon runner, and creator of The Path Back, an online pornography recovery program that is helping people reclaim their lives from the harmful effects of pornography. If you or anybody that you know is struggling to put pornography behind them once and for all, and trust me, it can be done, in an incredibly strength-based hold the shame, become the person you always knew you could be way, then please head over to pathbackrecovery.com. There you can download a short ebook that describes five common mistakes that people make when trying to get rid of pornography once and for all. Again, that is pathbackrecovery.com. And please visit Virtual Couch on Instagram. It's at Virtual Couch. I'm doing weekly question and answer sessions, typically around midweek, as well as a little bit of Instagram TV. So please follow along there. And you can find the Virtual Couch page on Facebook. That is new. Previously, I was just uh, pointing people to Tony Overbay, licensed marriage and family therapist. And you can go there as well. Like them both. Why not? And if you have a minute and you've enjoyed any of the Virtual Couch podcast material, it would uh, be amazing and incredible honor for me to have you rate and review, subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcast. That does help bring more eyes to the podcast. And please head over to TonyOverbay.com. I'm going to be sharing a lot more information on some programs and podcasts and more. Um, more release uh, information on a book that I co-authored that's getting some really good pre-release buzz. It's a book that I do feel like is going to help a lot of people. The book is called He's a Porn Addict, Now What? An Expert and a Former Addict Answer Your Questions. And I will be playing the role of expert and former virtual couch guest Joshua Shea, 
who already has authored a best-selling book called The Addiction Nobody Will Talk About, writes as the addict. And there is so much more to come on that front. But one of the things that I'm honestly curious about are Josh's answers to the questions that I spent literally months answering. So we, we tackled dozens and dozens of questions about pornography addiction and compulsive sexual behavior and betrayal trauma, and we answered them without knowing what the other person was writing. And again, more to follow soon. But on today's, let's get to today's episode. On this, uh, this topic is, is really, really fascinating. We're going to talk a bit about a concept that I can honestly say that I wasn't very familiar with. That is the language of depression. But before we go there, I think it's important to kind of nail down a concept that is pretty big in the world of acceptance and commitment therapy, or ACT. And ACT happens to be my therapy model of choice, for especially for doing individual therapy. So if you're new to the Virtual Couch Podcast, if somebody has forwarded this to you, you can go back and find several episodes that I've done on ACT. But for now, bear with me, because I'm going to read something from a very, very good site called learningact.com. And this is a blog post. It's pretty old. It's about a decade old. But it's talking about a concept called contacting self as context. And uh, this is going to be, I think this is going to frame things pretty nicely for where we're going today. So let me read a little bit and, and comment on this concept of self as context. So self as context is the concept that we are not the content of our experience. And, and truly bear with me here. So this is the, the concept of we're not our thoughts, we're not our feelings, or our experience sensations, the things that we see or the images that pass through our heads. So through exercises and metaphors, we can kind of uh, contact this sense of self that is more like the context or perspective or arena that life happens. And uh, if this is sounding a little bit ambiguous, a little bit foo-foo or that sort of thing, it really will make sense. And act, this self as context, is kind of contrasted, and I like this phrase, with self as content or the stories and thoughts that we have about ourselves or our identity or our history. So self as context is truly being able to kind of step back and see yourself in the context of what's going on at the moment. For me personally, this is one of the big breakthroughs of being able to kind of change my relationship with some of the thoughts that I have. Because remember, in any given minute, for example, we have dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of thoughts that go through our minds. But for some reason, we choose to kind of latch on to some of those thoughts and, uh, and they can get us pretty fired up or they can make us sad or this sort of thing. But at times we can kind of change this relationship with thought and just kind of step back and watch that thought go by because there's plenty more that are coming behind it. So in, there's a concept in ACT called fusion, and it's when you kind of start to fuse to those thoughts. So in fusion with self as content, we kind of lose this distinction between ourselves as the, they call it the experiencer of life, and then the thoughts and stories that we tell ourselves about our lives. So we would never get ourselves confused with like the chair that we're sitting on or something that we're looking at. But when it comes to noticing that we are distinct from our own thoughts, it kind of becomes a little bit harder to take this observer position and see the distance between ourselves and our thoughts. And I love that concept. We're not considering that we are fused to a chair. We know that we are sitting on the chair, but yet we will continue to say that we are fused to our thoughts, that we are what we, what we think or that we are what we believe. So in ACT, people are trained to be more aware of this kind of sense of self through a lot of different exercises, and some are kind of lengthy. However, learning these exercises can be also brief. And this, in this, uh, um, this learningact.com piece that I'm reading about right now, uh, they, they have a really good example. The author said, Today I stumbled upon an idea for an exercise that could create an experience of self as context. Um, the author said it came from an exercise by Eckhart Tolle, and uh, that this person modified to be more consistent with an act perspective and more focused on the self as context specifically. So here's the exercise. And uh, the author said, as I modified from the original. So stop. Here we go. Stop and silently listen to what you're saying to yourself. Right. You can do it right now. You can probably it might even be that uh, this is kind of silly. Don't know if I want to continue on or hurry up and get to the language of depression. Um, you know, you can have a lot of those kind of things that are going on in your mind. So stop and listen to uh, what you're saying to yourself, to, the, to this voice in your head. And once you're listening closely, ask yourself the following two questions. The first question, am I the thoughts that are going through my head? Or question number two, or am I the one who is aware of these thoughts that are going through my head? I love that one. It's kind of simplistic, right? In this exercise, our job with these questions is not to answer them, but rather to kind of sit with the question and wait, aware, and see what shows up. So this is not about creating more thoughts, but creating a new awareness where um, we are aware of the distinction between ourselves and our thoughts. Kind of cool, right? So the point of the exercise is not to create a belief in a new sense of self, but to develop the ability to step back from thoughts, to observe them, 
And when you observe them, you kind of have a little bit less entanglement. And, uh, and, I, and I hope that, that makes sense because this is like a pretty big concept in act and kind of in life in general. When we get really down, one of the things that we can really do is to be able to just have a, to, you know, when you kind of start to feel whatever you're feeling, feeling frustrated or scared or, or lonely or tired or these sort of things, that when you feel, you kind of recognize, okay, I'm feeling, so let me kind of step back and just take a little look, self as context, or what are, what are the kind of thoughts or those kind of stories that are going on in my head? And I love that if I go back to this example, am I the thoughts that are going through my head or am I the one who's aware of these thoughts that are going through my head? Okay, so the reason I believe that this concept, and this is kind of back to me, we're out of that article now, but the reason I believe that this concept, um, understanding the self as context is important for this episode, is that we're going to talk about some concepts and findings around the world of depression. And, and I understand, I get to work with people um, that, uh, that struggle with depression, clinical depression, situational depression, seasonal affective disorder, you know. Uh, those kind of uh, uh, concepts on a daily basis. And so I understand that people that are suffering with depression are often already operating from what I like to refer to as a lower emotional baseline. Meaning that, again, my, this concept that I, that, I, uh, that I love that I talk about called the emotional baseline is when everything is clicking, everything is right in your world, you have all these decisions kind of coming at you on a day-to-day basis. But when, you, when your emotional baseline is high, when you're feeling like you've got kind of things figured out, you're going to make uh, certain decisions to these everyday challenges or everyday questions. But when you're feeling a bit lower or a lot lower as your emotional baseline lowers, you're going to respond to these things, these questions, these day-to-day things that are coming at you differently, if at all. Sometimes people's emotional baselines become so low that they don't even want to get out of bed. They don't really want to respond back to people, that sort of thing. So so I recognize already that, that people that are struggling with depression may have a very low emotional baseline. So that's why I really wanted to, concept, to, to bring up that concept of self as context, because I would love for this just to be, um, well, as we kind of go over this article that we're about to go over today, rather than have the information or hear the information presented and then kind of feel bad because you might not, or you may be identifying with a lot of the language of depression, I would love to kind of challenge you to not fused to the thought of, man, I really am depressed if, you know, if I use these words or this language of depression as well, but more, I would love to challenge you to view the information today simply from an awareness standpoint, meaning that if you believe you can identify today with some of this, quote, language of depression, then just be aware of it because one of the first and most necessary steps toward change is simply being aware of something. Makes sense, right? You can't work on something if you're not even aware of it. It's the, if you, know, you, if you don't know what you don't know, I guess then you don't know it. So with that said, let's kind of get to this incredibly fascinating article on the language of depression. And uh, my wife actually read this and sent it to me. And I love when she does that. She's kind of looking out for me or for the things that uh, that I can share on a podcast. But this article comes from an author named Mohammed uh, Al-Mosawi, who at the time of this writing, and the, the article came out February 2nd, 2018. And I'm recording this uh, October something. I'm not quite even sure what, uh, October 7th in uh, 2019. But uh, the article came out February 2nd, 2018, and at that time, uh, Muhammad was a PhD candidate in psychology at the University of Reading, which I looked up. Reading is in Berkshire, England. But it is titled, um, actually, for the most part, uh, I will be reading this article, and I'm going to be commenting on it. And so I'm going to refer to the author as Muhammad because I truly don't want to continually mess up his name. So uh, so Muhammad's uh, article is called, People with Depression Use Language Differently, and Here's How to Spot It. So he begins it by saying, from the way you move and sleep to how you interact with people around you, depression changes just about everything. It's even noticeable in the way you speak and express yourself in writing. So sometimes this, quote, language of depression can have a powerful effect on others. Just consider the impact of the poetry and the song lyrics of Sylvia Plath. And uh, I, I was familiar with the, the na- her name, but I did look up. She was a poet who died in 1963. But he also references Kurt Cobain, who died in 1994. I believe he was around the age of uh, 27. And as a child of the 80s that I was, I was very familiar with Kurt Cobain and the music of Nirvana. But uh, both of them killed themselves after suffering from depression. So scientists have long tried to pin down the exact relationship between depression and language. And uh, technology is helping us get closer to a full picture. So Muhammad said that his study, published in Clinical uh, Psychological Science, has now unveiled a class of words that can help accurately predict whether someone is suffering from depression. And, and again, kind of take this article for what it is. It is some very um, solid science and data, but uh, I wanted to just hopefully bring awareness from some of the words or the language that people use often who are struggling with depression. 
So Muhammad says, traditionally, linguistic analysis in this field have been carried out by researchers reading and taking notes. So nowadays, computerized text analysis methods allow the process of extremely large, a processing of extremely large data banks in minutes. So he goes on to say that this can help spot linguistic features which humans might miss, and even calculating the percentage of uh, the percentage prevalence of words and classes of words, um, someone's lexical diversity, the average sentence length, grammatical patterns, and many other metrics. So, so far, he said that personal essays and diary, entry, diary entries by depressed people have been useful, as has been the work of well-known artists. And here's where he then refers to Cobain and Plath. So, for the spoken word, um, snippets of natural language of people with depression have also provided some insight. So, taken together, up to this point, or before, um, before this research was really kind of taken off, the findings from such research reveal clear and consistent differences in language between those with and without symptoms of depression. So now let's get into a little bit of the content. So Muhammad said that language can be separated into two components. There's content and there's style. So the content obviously relates to what we express. That is the meaning or the subject matter of those statements. So he says that it's no surprise to learn that those with symptoms of depression use an excessive amount of words conveying negative emotions, specifically negative adjectives and adverbs such as lonely or sad or miserable. But more interesting, he said, is the use of pronouns. This is the, where I really started to find this kind of fascinating. So those with symptoms of depression use significantly more first-person singular pronouns such as me, myself, and I, and significantly fewer second- and third-person pronouns such as they or them or she. So this pattern of pronoun use suggests that people with depression are often more focused on themselves and, uh, as Muhammad says, less connected with others. So re researchers have reported that pronouns actually are more reliable in identifying depression than the negative emotion words. So again, we're talking about more of the, the content. So he, he says that we know that rumination, which is a big thing in the world of depression, rumination, which is uh, dwelling on personal problems and social isolation are common features of depression. However, he says that we don't know whether these findings reflect differences in attention or thinking style. So, meaning that does depression cause people to focus on themselves or do people who focus on themselves get symptoms of depression, right? A little bit of uh, what comes first. So, now he talks about the style. So, he says that the style of language, remember we just talked about the, um, the content of language. So, now the style of language relates to how we express ourselves rather than the content that we express. So, um, Mohammed said that their lab recently conducted, and this is where things get really kind of fascinating, a big data text analysis of 64 different online mental health forums examining over 6,400 members. So now we've got a lot of data, a big sample size. So he said absolutist words, which convey absolute magnitudes or probabilities such as always, nothing, or completely, were found to be better markers for mental health forums than either pronouns or negative emotion words. So, so in these um, forums, you had more of these absolutist words. So nothing, completely, always. So from the outset, Mohammed said that we predicted that those with depression will have a more black and white view of the world and that this would manifest in their style of language. So he said, compared to 19 different control forums. So he named some, for example, uh, Mumsnet and Student Room. So these are forums that are not affiliated or don't have to do with mental health issues. He said the prevalence of absolutist words is approximately 50% greater in anxiety and depression forums and approximately 80% greater in suicidal ideation forums. So meaning these absolutist words were 50% greater in anxiety and depression forums, 80% greater in suicidal ideation forums. So then he said that pr uh, pronouns produced a similar distributional pattern of absolutist words across the forums, but the effect was smaller. So by contrast, negative emotion words... Um, he says, we're paradoxically less prevalent in suicidal ideation forums than in, in anxiety and depression forums. So what does that mean? So, so he's saying that there's still this, uh, the concept of noticing certain pronouns, um, but the effect was smaller than these kind of absolutist words in these mental health forums. So he said that the research also included recovery forums. And this is, I really think this is kind of showing that, uh, um, you know, more of what the content of uh, when you're, when people are feeling depressed versus even when they are in recovery. He said that in recovery forums where members who feel that they have recovered from a depressive episode write positive and encouraging posts about their recovery, here he found that the negative emotion words were used at a comparable, uh, at comparable levels to control forums. So meaning that when people found that they were feeling better about or overcoming depression or, or uh, recovering from depressive episodes, that their, um, these, these, uh, these words 
the negative emotion words were comparable to the control forums, the ones that are talking about being a mom or being a student, those sort of things. While positive emotion words were elevated by approximately 70%. So that's kind of fascinating. So in these recovery forums, the, uh, the, the, you know, these um, positive words, 70% greater. So nevertheless, the prevalence of absolutist words remains significantly greater than that of controls, but slightly lower than in anxiety and depression forums. So he said, crucially, those who have previously had depressive symptoms are more likely to have them again. Therefore, their greater tendency for absolutist thinking. Even when there are currently no signs of uh, symptoms of depression, that's a sign that it may play a role in causing depressive episodes. So that's, and I hope that that made sense. So here's where he's saying that, you know, the, the reality of depression is that people who have had depressive symptoms are more likely to have them again. So therefore, even when there's currently no symptoms of depression, they still tend to use these absolutist thinking words. And so the question is, is that a sign that it may play a cause or a role in causing these depressive episodes. So does the language that one uses, does that actually then at times kind of lead one back to having a depressive episode? So he said the same effect is seen in the use of pronouns, but not for these negative emotion words. So maybe you can see where we're going here is, so when, when you know, quote, times are good, or when the emotional baseline is higher, if people are still kind of stuck in using these, um, these kind of absolute, absolutionist thinking words, or uh, kind of fixated more on these um, I, me, my pronouns, could those play a role in then uh, causing someone to start to, to slowly go back into a depressive state? So, so he says, under practical implications, understanding the language of depression can help us understand the way those with symptoms of depression think, but it also has practical implications. He says, researchers are combining automated text analysis with machine learning, so that's computers that can learn from experience without being programmed, to classify a variety of mental health conditions from natural language text samples, such as blog posts. And here's, this is crazy. This is a part that uh, I think I always record the episode before I do the intros, but I, I, I know I'm going to do an intro that says, am I going to lose my job to a machine? But so such classification is already outperforming that made by trained therapists, which means importantly, machine learning classification Will, it will only improve more as more data is provided and more sophisticated algorithms are developed. So this goes beyond looking at the broad patterns of absolutionism and negativity and pronouns that we've already discussed. But work has begun on using computers to accurately identify increasingly specific subcategories of mental health problems such as perfectionism, self-esteem problems, and social anxiety. So, so, the, so what that paragraph says is that the diagnosis of a mental health um, issue is currently even um, outperforming the diagnosis made by a trained therapist. Now, does that mean that a machine can then become your therapist? I don't think so. But could a sample, a large sample size of your writing, start to um, make sense of maybe what the, the mental health issue or condition that you're having is? And uh, right now, the, the data looks pretty good. So that could actually help us understand more the, the way that people write, the more the, the way that people talk that could lead more to, hey, this is maybe where this diagnosis is heading. And then actually at that point, then help therapists work with clients. So Mohammed said, that said, it is, of course, possible to use a language associated with depression without actually being depressed. And, I, and I'm sure that if you're listening to this, you've uh, if you've hung on this far, you've thought, okay, but what if somebody just writes in that way? There are times where I'm writing an email and I'll notice the beginning of every paragraph is I, I, and I'm like, okay, dial it back there. Uh, <clears throat> you know, dial it back there a little, uh, egomaniac, you know, if I'm just, I'm this, I'm that. So ultimately it's how you feel over time that kind of determines whether you are suffering. So Muhammad goes on to say, but as the world health organization estimates that more than 300 million people worldwide are now living with significant depression an increase of more than 18% since 2005, having more tools available to spot the condition is certainly important to improve health and prevent tragic suicides, such as those of Plath and Cobain. So again, this is me now jumping back in here. Um, and that article, by the way, uh, was originally published. Um, this is, and I'll link to this, The Conversation by Mohammed Al-Mozawi. And the, the article is really fascinating, though. It goes on to a little bit more detail as well. But, uh, but so I, that said, you know, I, I really hope that uh, by simply bringing some awareness to the language that perhaps you use, or perhaps more importantly, to the language of those around you, if you believe that you use a lot of similar, we'll kind of call it these language of depression words, the goal would simply be to bring some awareness to it. Because, I, you know, and I noticed, I was thinking about this, I find myself often 
in conversation, talking with somebody, and I truly will notice that I'm about to complain about something or bring something back to me. And when I have that awareness, then it's much easier to turn the conversation back to the person I'm talking about. It, it, and, I, and I think about this too, is that, you know, in order to kind of find oneself, there's a, what, there's a saying that to lose yourself in the service of others. And, and I truly do believe that. And, uh, and I've watched that over the years. I've watched that, I can say, in dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of client situations, especially those that are struggling with depression, that being able to kind of get outside of oneself is, is sometimes all, it's one of the best starts to start to what I say, elevate or raise this emotional baseline. And as one starts to do that, to raise one's emotional baseline, to maybe get outside of oneself, that those are times where as that baseline raises, then it, then they may be able to kind of um, respond a little bit differently to the world around them. And so, and I, boy, I think about an example right now I'll, I'll throw out there of working with a, a, just an amazing, wonderful individual. I really love working with this person. This was years and years and years ago, but the person was feeling a little bit down. And this is a person who at one point we'd even um, decided, Hey, let's just get one of those egg timers. I believe they're called. Now you could just set something on your watch. That was how long ago this was or not watch. I mean, there are watches, of course, uh, still, but on your phone where you could set a timer for a minute or and it was more like, I think for this person, it was every 30 minutes or every hour of an hour. So when this person was having a severe depressive episode, when this button or this alarm would go off, this egg timer would go off, their goal was just to get up and go take a walk around the block and come back. That was it. And, uh, and just doing that every half an hour, every hour just started to kind of feel like, okay, I'm doing something. And, and that just raised the baseline up just enough to then do a little something more, a little something more. That person then um, went on to volunteer. They, uh, you know, they were, they were looking for a job. They were struggling to find a job, but in the interim, they, they were able to volunteer um, cooking. They cooked at a, I think it was an elderly folks home and uh, we're doing that two or three days a week. And and it was such an amazing experience because then they, they started to kind of interact with more people. They started to serve people, especially these uh, older folks at this home, And no, they weren't an amazing cook to begin with, but this was just a volunteer kind of get outside of themselves experience. And then that led to getting a job. The job led to kind of putting themselves out there, feeling a little more confident. Um, This person did end up uh, with that confidence, kind of going and putting themselves out there more in in kind of a social or dating arena and uh, did go on to get married and has now had a couple of kids. And I look at that often and just think that one of those things that really started to help this person was just being able to, to look outside of themselves and, uh, and, and truly, those are some of the examples. And I have a lot of those examples where just somebody being able to, to kind of, you know, see themselves as self as context and then and be able to kind of just step outside of themselves and start to look and serve others. So if this this concept, these language of depression, if that's the thing that starts to help you recognize, OK, I, I am kind of just really you know, stuck in this absolutionist thinking or these kind of I or me or myself, that kind of those kind of pronouns are prevalent in your writing or even in your speech, then just bring a little bit of awareness to it. Please, no, no guilt, no shame. Those aren't allowed in my dojo. But uh, but please, um, I mean, of course, if you bring them in, we'll work with those. But but please, you know, kind of take this awareness to kind of step back and say, okay, I see what's happening here. You know, that I maybe am using some of that language. And so if that's the case, just bring a little bit of awareness to it. And when you have that awareness, you can kind of seek to change a little bit. So, I mean, I really do feel like there are many people that I have in my office who do talk about whether it's family members or friends who they want to help, but who it can be a challenge to talk to because the person may continually be kind of going back to these absolutionist uh, phrases or talking about their problems again and again. And, and again, we all need people who we can open up to. But if you find that you're primarily stuck in that wanting to share your problems, challenges, inequalities, the unfairness to anybody that will listen, perhaps you could benefit from reaching out to a therapist. And I think that could be a very good thing. All right. Hey, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today on the virtual couch. I hope this episode can bring a little bit more awareness to this language of depression and this concept and and help you or somebody that you know get the help that they need or perhaps simply help you or again, someone that you know, bring some awareness to truly look outside of yourself and perhaps uh, turning toward others or the service of others might just be the thing that brings your own emotional baseline up to where it needs to be. And then at some point you'll hit this, what again, I love to call the tipping point, which then allows you to be more present with others and just feeling a little bit better about yourself and your own life. All right. Hey, uh, taking us away today in one more second here is former virtual couch guest Aurora Florence, who, and here's one, please go check out my Tony Overbay licensed marriage and family therapist Facebook page because uh, just this morning, last night, I shared a Kickstarter that Aurora and her amazingly talented husband, Jeff, are doing 
for post-production on an incredible project called, and uh, the, the, the name alone sells it, The Anxious Taxidermist. And I had a chance to see the script for The, Anxi- Anx- uh, the Anxious Taxidermist early in the process, and it's, it's amazing. And it really, and this is going to come to the big screen. They filmed this. The story follows a character named Marie, who is a young woman who uses her secret passion for taxidermy to cope with debilitating anxiety. And uh, it mixes humor, amazing music. Again, Roar is an amazing musician and singer. Uh, but it, it mixes humor and music, and it tackles a very real problem, anxiety, in a way that I honestly think can help people who truly do struggle with anxiety, as well as other mental health conditions. So um, go, go support their Kickstarter. I'll have a link to that as well. But uh, taking us out today is her song, It's Wonderful, and I'll see you next time on The Virtual Couch. Compressed emotions flying past Our heads and out the other end The pressures of the daily grind It's wonderful Elastic waste and rubber ghost Are floating past the midnight hour They push aside